Chapter Eleven of Ravensdene Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Five Conclusions. We who sat around that table during the next hour must have made a strange group. Mr. Raven, always a little nervous and flustered in manner, his niece, fresh and eager, in her pretty dinner dress, a curious contrast to the antiquated garb and parchment face of old Cazalette, who sat by her, watchful and doubting. The officialdom suggesting figure of the police inspector, erect and rigid in his close-fitting uniform, the detective, rubicund and confident, though of what one scarcely knew, Lorimore and myself, keen listeners and watchers, and last, but not by any means least, the notable, the bland, suave Chinaman in his neat native dress, sitting modestly in the background, inscrutable as an image carved out of ivory. I do not know what the rest thought, but it lay in my own mind that if there was one man in that room who might be trusted to find his way out of the maze in which we were wandering, that man was Dr. Lorimore's servant. It was Lorimore who, at the detective's request, explained to Wing why we had sent for him. The Chinaman nodded a grave assent when reminded of the Salter Quick affair. Evidently he knew all about it. And if one really could detect anything at all in so carefully veiled a countenance, I thought I detected an increased watchfulness in his eyes when Scarterfield began to ask him questions arising out of what Lorimore had said. There is evidence, began the detective, that this man Salter Quick and his brother Noah Quick were mixed up in some affair that had connection with a trading steamer, the Elizabeth Robinson, believed to have been lost in the Yellow Sea between Hong Kong and Chemulpo in October 1907. On board that steamer was a certain Chinaman, who two years later turned up in London. Now, Dr. Lorimore tells me that when you and he were in London some little time ago, you spent a good deal of time amongst your own people in the East End, and that you also visited some of them in Liverpool, Cardiff, and Swansea. So I want to ask you, did you ever hear, in any of these quarters, of a man named Chu Fun? Here in London, two years after the Elizabeth Robinson affair, that's three years back from now. The Chinaman moved his head very slightly. No, he answered, not in London, nor in England, but I knew a man named Chu Fan ten, eleven years ago, before I went to Bombay and entered my present service. Where did you know him? asked Scarterfield. Two, perhaps three places, said Wing. Singapore, Penang, perhaps Rangoon, too. I remember him. What was he? A cook, a very good cook. Would you be surprised to hear of his being in England three years ago? Not at all. Many Chinamen come here. I myself, why not others? If Chu Fun came here three years ago, perhaps he came as cook on some ship trading from China or Burma, then go back again. I wonder if he did, muttered the detective. Still, he continued, turning to Wing, a lot of your people, when they come here, stop, don't they? Many stop in this country, said Wing. Laundry business, eating houses, groceries, and so on, suggested Scarterfield, and chiefly in the places I've mentioned, eh? The east end of London, Liverpool, and the two big Welsh towns? Now, I want to ask you a question. This man I'm talking of, Chu Fun, was certainly in London three years ago. Are there places and people in London where one could get to hear of him? Where I could get to hear of him, yes, answered Wing. You say, where you could get to hear of him, remarked Scarterfield. Does that mean that you would get information which I shouldn't get? The very faintest ghost of a smile showed itself in the wrinkles about the Chinaman's eyes. He inclined his head a little, politely, and Lorimore stepped into the arena. What Wing means is that being a Chinaman himself, naturally he could get news of a fellow Chinaman from fellow Chinamen where you, an Englishman, wouldn't get any at all, he said with a laugh. I dare say that if you, Mr. Scarterfield, 
went down Limehouse Way seeking particulars about Chu Fen, you'd be met with blank faces and stopped ears. "'That's just what I'm suggesting, Doctor,' answered the detective good-humouredly. "'I'll put the thing in a nutshell. My profound belief is that if we want to get to the bottom of these two murders, we've got to go back a long way, to the Elizabeth Robinson time, and that Chu Fen is the only person I've heard of up to now who can throw a light on that episode. And it seems to me, to be plain about it, that Mr. Wing there could be extremely useful.' how asked lorrimore he's at your service i'm sure well by finding out if this chu fen when he was here three years since made any revelations to his chinese brethren in limehouse or elsewhere replied scarterfield he may have known something about the brothers quick and concerning that elizabeth robinson affair that would help immensely any little thing a mere scrap of information just a bit of chance gossip a hint you don't know how valuable these things are the mere germ of a clue you know i know said lorrimore he turned to a servant and addressed him in some strange tongue in which wing at once responded for some minutes they talked together volubly then lorrimore looked around at scarterfield wing says that if chu fun was in london three years ago he can engage to find out how long he was here whence he came, and why, and where he went, he said. I gather that there's a strange sort of freemasonry amongst these men. Naturally, they seek each other out in strange lands, and there are places in London and the other parts to which a Chinaman resorts if he happens to land in England. This he can do for you. He's no doubt of it. There's another thing, said Scarterfield. If Chu Fen is still in England, as he may be, can he find him? Wing's smooth countenance on hearing this showed some sign of animation. Instead of replying to the detective, he again addressed his master in the foreign tongue. Lorrimore nodded and turned to Scarterfield with a slightly cynical smile. "'He says that if Chu Fen is anywhere in England, he can lay hands on him quickly,' said Lorrimore. "'But he adds that it might not be at all convenient to Chu Fen to come into the full light of day.' Chu Fen may have reasons of his own for desiring strict privacy. "'I take you,' said Scarterfield with a wink. "'All right, doctor. If Mr. Wing can unearth Mr. Chu Fen, and that mysterious gentleman can give me a tip, I'll respect his privacy. So now, do we get at something? Do I understand that your man will help us by trying to find out some particulars of Chu Fen, or laying hands on Chu Fen himself?' All expenses defrayed, you know, he went on, turning to Wing, and a handsome remuneration if it leads to results. And follow your own plans. I know you Chinamen are smart and deep at this sort of thing. Leave it to him, said Lorrimore, to him and to me. If there's news to be had of this man Chu Fen, he'll get it. Then that is something done, exclaimed Scarterfield, rubbing his hands. Good. I like to see a bit of progress. But now, while I'm here, and while we're at business, and I hope this young lady doesn't find it dull business, there's another matter. The inspector tells me there have been alarms and excursions about a certain tobacco box which was found on Salter Quick, that Mr. Cazalet, you, sir, I think, had had various experiments in connection with it, and that the thing has been stolen. Now, I want to know all about that. Who can tell me most? Mr. Cazalet was sitting between Miss Raven and myself. I leaned close to him and whispered, feeling that now was the time to bring every known fact to light. Tell all, all you told me just before dinner, I urged upon him. Table the whole pack of cards. Let us get at something now. He hesitated, looking half suspiciously from one to the other of those opposite. "'Ye think I'd be well advised, Middlebrook?' he whispered. "'Is it wise policy to show all the cards you're holding?' "'In this case, yes,' I said. "'Tell everything.' "'Well,' he said, "'maybe. "'But it's on your advice, you'll remember, "'and I'm not sure this is the time, nor just the company. "'However—' 
so for the second time that day mr cazalette told the story of the tobacco box and of his pocket-book and produced his photograph it came as a surprise to all there but myself and i saw that mr raven in particular was much perturbed by the story of the theft that morning i knew what he was thinking the criminal or criminals were much too close at hand he cut in now and then with a the question but the detective listened in grim absorbed silence now you know this really is about the most serious and important thing i've heard so far he said when mr cazalette had finished just let's sum it up salter quick is murdered in a strange and lonely place not for his goods for all his money and his valuables not inconsiderable are found on him but the murderer was in search of something that he believed to be on salter quick for he thoroughly searched his clothing slashed its linings turned his pockets out and probably no we may safely say certainly failed in his search he did not get what he was after any more than his fellow murderer who slew noah quick some hundreds of miles away from here about the same time got what he was after but now comes in mr cazalette mr cazalette inadvertently never thinking what he was doing draws public attention to certain marks and scratches evidently made on purpose in salter quick's tobacco box do you see my point gentlemen the murderer hears of this and says to himself that box is the thing i want so he appropriates it at the inquest but even then so faint and almost illegible are the marks within the lid he doesn't find exactly what he wants but he knows that mr cazalette was going to submit his photograph to an enlarging process which would make the marks clearer he also knows mr cazalette's habits a highly significant fact so he sets himself to steal mr cazalette's pocket-book theorizing that mr cazalette probably has a copy of the enlarged photograph within it and this morning while mr cazalette is bathing he gets it gentlemen what does this show one thing is a certainty the murderer is close at hand there was a dead silence broken at last by a querulous murmur from mr cazalette himself ye may be as sure o' that my man as that arthur's seat overlooks edinburgh he said i wish i was as sure of his identity well we know something that's gradually bringing us toward establishing that remarked scarterfield let me see that photograph again if you please the rest of us watched scarterfield as he studied the thing over which mr cazalette and i had exercised our brains in the half hour before dinner he seemed to get no more information from a long perusal of it than we had got and he finally threw it away from him across the table with a muttered exclamation which confessed discomfiture miss raven picked up the photograph ay mumbled mr cazalette let the lassie look at it maybe a woman's brains is more use than a man's wiles often said the detective and if miss raven can make anything of that i saw that miss raven was already wishful to speak and i hastened to encourage her by throwing a word to scarterfield you'd be infinitely obliged to her i'm sure i put in it would be a help no slight one said he there's something in that diagram but what miss raven timid and a little shy of concentrated attention laid the photograph again on the table don't don't you think there may be some explanation of this in what salter quick said to mr middlebrook when they met on the cliffs she asked he told mr middlebrook that he wanted to find a churchyard where there were graves of people named netherfield but he didn't know exactly where it was though it was somewhere in this locality now supposing this is a rough outline of that churchyard these outer lines may be the wall then these little marks may show the situation of the netherfield graves and that cross in the corner perhaps there is something buried hidden there which salter quick wanted to find the detective uttered a sharp exclamation and snatched up the photograph again good good he said upon my word i shouldn't wonder 
To be sure, that may be it. What's against it? This, remarked Mr. Cazalet solemnly, that there isn't anybody of the name of Netherfield buried between Almouth and Boodle Bay. That's a fact. Established, added the police inspector, by as an exhaustive inquiry as anybody could make. It is a fact, as Mr. Cazalet says. Well, observed Scarterfield, but Salter Quick may have been wrong in his locality. You can be sure of this. Whatever secret he held was got from somebody else. He may have been twenty, thirty, even fifty miles out. But we know something. The Netherfield who was with him on the Elizabeth Robinson hailed from Blythe in this county. I'm going to Blythe myself tomorrow. I'll find out if there are Netherfields buried about there. Personally, I believe Miss Ravens hit the nail on the head. This is a rough chart of a spot Salter Quick wanted to find, where, no doubt, something is hidden. What? Who knows? But judging from the fact that two men have been murdered for the secret of it, something of great value. Buried treasure, no doubt. That's precisely what I've been thinking from the very first, murmured Mr. Cazalet and you'll have to go back, to go back, my man. It's certainly the only way of going forward, agreed Scarterfield with a laugh. But now, before we part, gentlemen, let us see where we have got to. I, for myself, have drawn five distinct conclusions about this affair. First, that the Quicks, Noah and Salter, were in possession of a secret which was probably connected with their shipmate of the Elizabeth Robinson, Netherfield, who hailed from Blythe. Second, that certain men knew the Quicks to be in possession of that secret, and murdered both to get hold of it. Third, that they failed to get it from either Noah or Salter. Fourth, that Mr. Cazalet's zeal about the tobacco box, publicly expressed, put the criminals on a new scent, and that they, in pursuance of it, stole both the tobacco box and Mr. Cazalet's pocket book. Fifth, that the criminals are, or were very recently, in fact this very morning, in the vicinity of this place. So, he continued looking round, the thing's narrowing. Let Mr. Wing there help by getting some news of Chu Fen, if possible. As for me, I'm going to follow up the Netherfield line. I think we shall track these fellows yet. You never know how unexpectedly a clue may turn up. "'You've not said anything about the handkerchief that I found,' observed Mr. Cazalet. "'There's a clue, certainly.' "'Difficult to follow up, sir,' replied Scarterfield. "'There is such a thing as little articles of that sort, being lost at the laundry, put into the wrong basket, and so on. Now, if we could trace the owner of the handkerchief, and find where he gets his washing done, and a great deal more, you see? But we'll not lose sight of it, Mr. Cazalet.' Only, there are more important clues than that to go on in the meantime. The great thing is, what was this precious secret that the Quicks shared, and that certainly had to do with some place here in Northumberland? Let's get at that, if we can. The two police officials went away with Dr. Lorimore and his servant, all in deep converse, and the four of us who were left behind endeavoured to settle our minds for the repose of the night. But I saw that Mr. Raven had been upset by the recent talk. He had got it firmly fixed in his consciousness that the murderer of Salter Quick was, as it were, in our very midst. "'How do I know that the guilty man mayn't be one of my own servants?' he muttered, as he, Mr. Cazalet, and I took up our candles. "'There were six men in the house, all strangers to me, and several employed outside.' The idea's deucedly unpleasant. "'Ye may put it clear away from you, Raven,' said Mr. Cazalet. "'The murderer may be within bowshot, but he's none of yours. You'll look deeper, far, far deeper than that. This is no ordinary affair, and no ordinary men at the bottom of it.' Then, when he and I had left our host, and were going along one of the upstairs passages towards our own rooms, he added, no ordinary man, Middlebrook, but you see how ordinary folk are suspicioned. Raven'll be doubting the bona fides of his own footman and his own garden lads next. 
no no it'll be deeper down than that my lad the mystery is deep i agreed ay and i'm wondering if it was well to let yon chinese fellow into all of it he muttered significantly i'm no great believer in orientals middlebrook lorrimore answers for him said i and who answers for lorrimore he demanded what do you or i know of lorrimore i'm thinking yon lorrimore was far too glib of his tongue and maybe i was too ready myself and talked beyond reason to strangers i don't know lorrimore nor his chinaman from which i gathered that mr cazalet himself was not superior to suspicions end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Ravenstein Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Netherfield Baxter. However, Mister Raven's nerves may have been wrung by the mysterious events which found place around his recently acquired possessions. Nothing untoward or disturbing occurred at Ravenstein Court itself at that time. Indeed, had it not been for what we heard from the outside and for such doings as the visit of the inspector and scarterfield the daily life under mr raven's roof would have been regular and decorous almost to the point of monotony we were all engaged in our respective avocations mr cazalet with his coins and medals i with my books and papers mr raven with his steward his gardeners and his various potterings about the estate miss raven with her flowers and her golf certainly there was relaxation and in taking it we sorted out each other mr raven and mr cazalet made common cause of an afternoon they were of that period of life despite the gulf of twenty years between them when lounging in comfortable chairs under old cedar trees on a sunlit lawn is preferable to active exercise miss raven and i being younger found our diversion in golf and in occasional explorations of the surrounding country she had a touch of the nomadic instinct in her so had i the neighbourhood was new to both we began to find great pleasure in setting out on some excursions as soon as lunch was over and prolonging our wanderings until the falling shadows warned us that it was time to make for home what these pilgrimages led to in more ways than one will eventually appear we heard nothing of scarterfield the detective nor of wing pressed into his service for some days after the consultation in mr raven's dining-room then as we were breakfasting one morning the post-bag was brought in and mr raven opening it presently handed me a letter in an unfamiliar handwriting the envelope of which bore the postmark blythe i guessed of course that it was from scarterfield and immediately began to wonder what on earth made him write to me but there it was he had written and here is what he wrote north sea hotel blythe northumberland april twenty three nineteen twelve dear sir you will remember that when we were discussing matters the other night round mr raven's table i mentioned that i intended visiting this town in order to make some inquiries about the man netherfield who was with the brothers Quick on the Elizabeth Robinson. I have been here two days, and I have made some very curious discoveries. And I am now writing to ask you if you could so far oblige and help me in my investigations as to join me here for a day or two at once. The fact is, I want your assistance. I understand that you are an expert in deciphering documents and the like, and I have come across certain things here in connection with this case which are beyond me. I can assure you that if you would make it convenient to spare me even a few hours of your valuable time, you would put me under great obligations to you. Yours truly, Thomas Scarterfield. I read this letter twice over before handing it to Mr. Raven. Its perusal seemed to excite him. Bless me, he exclaimed how very extraordinary what strange mysteries we seem to be living amongst you'll go of course middlebrook you think i should i asked oh certainly certainly he said with emphasis if any of us can do anything to solve this strange problem i think we should 
Of course, one hasn't the faintest idea what it is that the man wants. But from what I observed of him the other evening, I should say that Scarterfield is a clever fellow, a very clever fellow, who should be helped. Scarterfield, I remarked, glancing at Miss Raven and at Mr. Cazalette, who were manifesting curiosity, has made some discoveries at Blythe about the Netherfield man, and he wants me to go over there and help him, to elucidate something, I think, but what it is I don't know. Oh, of course you must go, exclaimed Miss Raven. How exciting! Mr. Cazalette, aren't you jealous already? No, but I'm curious, answered Mr. Cazalette, to whom I had passed the letter. I see the man wants something deciphered. Aye, that'll be in your line, Middlebrook. Didn't I tell all of you all along that there'd be more in this business than met the eye? Well, I'll be inquisitive to know what new developments have arisen. It's a strange fact, but it is a fact, that in affairs of this sort there's often evidence, circumstantial, strong, lying ready to be picked up, next door, as it were, and as it is evidently in this case, for Blythe's a town that's not so far away. Far away or near away, it took me some hours to get to Blythe, for I had to drive to Alnwick and later to change at Morpeth and again at Newsham. But there I was at last, in the middle of the afternoon, and there on the platform to meet me was the detective, as rubicund and cheerful as ever, and full of gratitude for my speedy response to his request. "'I got your telegram, Mr. Middlebrook,' he remarked, as we walked away from the station, and I've booked you the most comfortable room I could get in the hotel, which is a nice quiet house, where we'll be able to talk in privacy. For barring you and myself, there's nobody stopping in it, except a few commercial travellers, and to be sure they've their own quarters. You'll have had your lunch?' "'While I waited at Morpeth,' I answered. "'Aye,' he said, "'I figured on that. So we'll just get into a corner of the smoking-room and have a quiet glass over a cigar, and I'll tell you what I've made out here, and a very strange and queer tale it is, and one that's worth hearing, whether it really has to do with our affair or no.' "'You're not sure that it has?' I asked. "'I'm as sure as may be that it probably has,' he replied. "'But still, there's a gulf between extreme probability and absolute certainty "'that's a bit wider than the unthinking reckon for. "'However, here we are, and we'll just get comfortable.' Scarterfield's ideas of comfort, I found, were to dispose himself in the easiest of chairs, in the quietest of corners, with whisky and soda on one hand and a box of cigars on the other. This sort of thing he evidently regarded as a proper relaxation from his severe mental labours. I had no objection to it myself, after four hours of slow travelling, yet I confess I felt keenly impatient, until he had mixed our drinks, lighted his cigar, and settled down at my elbow. Now, he said confidentially, I'll set it all out in order, what I've done and found out since I came here two days ago. There's no need, Mr. Middlebrook, to go into detail how I set to work to get information. We've our own ways and methods for getting hold of stuff when we strike a strange town. But you know what I came here for. There's been talk all through this case of the name Netherfield, from the questions that Salter Quick put to you when you met him on the cliffs, and from what was said at the Mariner's Joy. Very good. Now I fell across that name, too, in my investigations in London, as being the name of a man who was on the Elizabeth Robinson of uncertain memory, lost or disappeared in the year 1907 with the two quicks. He was set down, that Netherfield, as being of Blythe, Northumberland. Clearly, then, Blythe was a place to get in touch with, and here in Blythe we are. A clear bit of preface, Scarterfield, said I approvingly, Go ahead, I'm bearing in mind that you've been here forty-eight hours. I've made good use of my time, he chuckled, with a knowing grin. Although I say it myself, Mr. Middlebrook, I'm a bit of a hustler. Well, self-praise, they say, is no recommendation, though to be sure I'm no believer in that old proverb 
for after all who knows a man better than himself so we'll get to the story i came here of course to see if i could learn anything of a man of this place who answered to what i had already learnt about netherfield of the elizabeth robinson i went to the likely people for news and i very soon found out something nobody knew anything of any man old or young named william netherfield belonging present or past to this town but a good many people most if not all people do know of a man who used to be much in evidence here some years ago a man of the name of netherfield baxter netherfield baxter i repeated not a name to be readily forgotten once known he's not forgotten said scarterfield grimly and he was well enough known here once upon a time and not so long since either and now who was netherfield baxter well he was the only child of an old tradesman of this town whose wife died when netherfield was a mere boy and who died himself when his son was only seventeen years of age old baxter was a remarkably foolish man he left all he had to this lad some twelve thousand pounds in such a fashion that he came into absolute uncontrolled possession of it on attaining his twenty-first birthday now then you can imagine what happened my young gentleman nobody to say him nay no father mother sister brother to restrain him or give him a word in season or a hearty kicking which would have been more to the purpose went the pace pretty considerably horses cards champagne you know the twelve thousand began to melt like wax in a fire he carried on longer than was expected for now and then he had luck on the race course won a good deal once i heard on the big race at newcastle what they call the pitman's derby but it went all of it went and by the beginning of the year nineteen four bear the date in mind mr middlebrook netherfield baxter was just about on his last legs he was in fact living from hand to mouth he was then i've been particular about collecting facts and statistics just twenty-nine years of age so one way or another he'd made his little fortune last him eight years he still had good clothes a very taking good-looking fellow he was they say and he'd a decent lodging but in spring nineteen four he was living on the proceeds of chance betting and was sometimes very low down and in may of that year he disappeared in startlingly sudden fashion without saying a word to anybody and since then nobody has ever seen a vestige or ever heard a word of him scarterfield paused looking at me as if to ask what i thought of it i thought a good deal of it a very interesting bit of life drama scarterfield said i and there have been far stranger things than it would be if this netherfield baxter of blythe turned out to be the william netherfield of the elizabeth robinson you haven't hit on anything in the shape of a bridge a connecting link between the two not yet anyway he answered and i don't think it's at all likely that i shall hear for as i said just now nobody in this place has ever heard of netherfield baxter since he walked out of his lodging one evening and clean vanished to be sure there's nobody at all anxious to hear of him for one thing he left no near and dear relations or friends for another he left no debts behind him the last fact of course added scarterfield with a wink was due to another very pertinent fact nobody to be sure in his latter stages would give him credit you've more to tell i suggested oh much more he acquiesced we're about halfway through the surface matters now then you're bearing in mind that netherfield baxter disappeared very suddenly in may nineteen four perhaps the town didn't make much to do over his disappearance for a good reason it was just then in the very midst of what we generally call a nine days wonder for some months the old alliance bank here had been in charge of a temporary manager in consequence of the regular manager's long continued illness this temporary manager was a chap named lester john martindale lester 
who had come here from a branch of the same bank at Hexham, across country. Now this Lester was a young man who was greatly given to going about on a motorcycle. Not so many of those things about then, as we see now. He was always tearing about the country, they say, on half-holidays and Saturdays and Sundays, and one evening, careering round a sharp corner, somewhere just outside town in the dark, he ran full tilt into a cart that carried no tail light and broke his neck. They picked him up dead. Well, said I, you're wondering if that's anything to do with Netherfield Baxter's disappearance, said Scarterfield. Well, it's an odd thing. But out of all the folk that I've made inquiry of in the town, I haven't come across one yet who voluntarily suggested that it had. But I do, and you'll presently see why I think so. Now this man, John Martindale Lester, was accidentally killed about the beginning of the first week in May 1904. Three or four days later, Netherfield Baxter cleared out. I've been careful in my conversations with the town folk, officials mostly, not to appear to connect Lester's death with Baxter's departure. But that there was a connection, I'm dead certain. Baxter hooked it, Mr. Middlebrook, because he knew that Lester's sudden death would lead to an examination of things in the old Alliance Bank. Ah, said I, I begin to see things. So do I through smoked glass though as yet assented scarterfield but it's getting clearer now things at the bank were examined and some nice revelations came forth to begin with there was the cash deficiency not a heavy one but quite heavy enough in addition to that certain jewels were missing which had been deposited with the bankers for security by a lady in this neighbourhood they were worth some thousands of pounds and to add to this, two chests of plate were gone, which had been placed with the bank some years before by the executors of the will of the late Lord Forestburn, to be kept there till the coming of age of his heir, a minor when his father died. Altogether, Mr. John Martindale Lester and his accomplices, or accomplice, had helped themselves very freely to things, until then safe in the vaults and the strong-room. "'Have you found out if Netherfield Baxter and the temporary bank manager were acquainted?' I asked. "'No, that's a matter I've very carefully refrained from inquiring into,' answered Scarterfield. "'So far no one has mentioned their acquaintanceship or association to me, and I haven't suggested it, for I don't want to raise suspicions. I want to keep things to myself, so that I can play my own game.' No, I've never heard of the two men spoken of in connection with each other. What is thought in the town about Lester and the valuables, I inquired? They must have some theory. Oh, of course they have, he replied. The theory is that Lester had accomplices in London, that he shipped these valuables off there, and that when his accomplices heard of his sudden death, they, why, they just held their tongues. But my notion is that the only accomplice Lester had was our friend Netherfield Baxter. You've some ground? I asked. Yes, or I shouldn't think so, said Scarterfield. I'm now coming to the reason of my sending for you, Mr. Middlebrook. I told you that this fellow Baxter had a decent lodging in the town. Well, I made it my business to go there yesterday morning, and finding that the landlady was a sensible woman, and likely to keep a quiet tongue, I just told her a bit of my business, and asked her some questions. Then I found out that Baxter left various matters behind him, which he still had. Clothes, books, he was evidently a chap for reading, and of superior education, which probably accounts for what I'm going to tell you. Papers, and the like. I got her to let me have a sight of them and amongst the papers I found two, which seemed to me to have been written hundreds of years ago, and to be lists with names and figures in them. My impression is that Lester found them in those chests of plate, couldn't make them out, and gave them to Netherfield Baxter as being a better educated man. Baxter, I found out, did well at school, and could read and write two or three languages. 
Well, now, I persuaded the landlady to lend me these documents for a day or two, and I've got them in my room upstairs, safely locked up. I'll fetch them down presently, and you shall see if you can decipher them. Very old they are, and the writing's crabbed and queer. But, Lord bless you, the ink's as black as jet. Scarterfield, said I, it strikes me you possibly hit on a discovery. Supposing this stolen stuff is safely hidden somewhere about, supposing Netherfield Baxter knew where, and that he's the William Netherfield of the Elizabeth Robinson, supposing that he let the quicks into the secret, supposing, but, bless me, there are a hundred things one can suppose. Anyhow, I believe we're getting at something." "'I've been supposing a lot of what you've just suggested ever since yesterday morning,' he answered quietly. "'Didn't I say we should have to hark back? Well, I'll fetch down these documents.' He went away, and while he was absent, I stood at the window of the smoking-room, looking out on the life of the little town and wondering. There, across the street, immediately in front of the hotel, was the bank of which Scarterfield had been telling me an old-fashioned, grey-walled, red-roofed place, the outer door of which was just then being closed for the day by a white-whiskered old porter in a sober-hued uniform. Was it possible, could it really be, that the story which had recently ended in a double murder had begun in that quiet-looking house through the criminality of an untrustworthy employee? But did I say ended? Nay, for all I knew, the murderers of the Quicks were only an episode, a chapter in the story. The end was where? Then Scarterfield came back, and from a big envelope drew forth and placed in my hands two folded pieces of old, time-yellowed parchment. End of chapter 12《ラヴィット・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・ジョン・showed me that he had accidentally come across a really important find. Within another moment I was deeply engrossed, and he saw that I was. He sat silently watching me, once or twice looking up at him. I saw him nod as if to imply that he had felt sure of the importance of the things he had given me. And presently, laying the documents on the table between us, I smiled at him. "'Scarterfield,' I said, are you at all up in the history of your own country? Couldn't say that I am, Mr. Middlebrook, he answered with a shake of his head. Not beyond what a lad learns at school, and I dare say I've forgotten a lot of that. My job, you see, has always been with the hard facts of the actual present, not with what took place in the past. But you're up to certain notable episodes, I suggested. You know, for instance, that when the religious houses were suppressed, abbeys, priories, convents, hospitals, in the reign of Henry the Eighth, a great deal of their plate and jewels were confiscated to the use of the king? Oh, I've heard that, he admitted. Nice haul the old chap got, too, I'm given to understand. He didn't get all, said I. A great deal of the monastic plate disappeared, clean vanished. It used to be said that a lot of it was hidden away or buried by its owners, but it's much more likely that it was stolen by the covetous and greedy folk of the neighborhood, the big men, of course. Anyway, while a great deal was certainly sent by the commissioners to the King's Treasury in London, a lot more, especially in out-of-the-way places and districts, just disappeared and was never heard of again. Up here in the north of England that was very often the case and all this is merely a preface to what I'm going to tell you. Have you the least idea of what these documents are? No, he replied, unless they're lists of something. I did make out that they might be, by the way the words and figures are arranged, like inventories. They are inventories, I exclaimed, both, 
written in crabbed calligraphy too but easy enough to read if you're acquainted with sixteenth-century penmanship spelling and abbreviations look at the first one it is here described as an inventory of all the jewels plate etc appertaining and belonging unto the abbey of forestburn and it was made in the year fifteen thirty six this abbey therefore was one of the smaller houses that came under the two hundred pound limit and was accordingly suppressed in the year just mentioned now look at the second it also is an inventory of the jewels and plate of the priory of mellerton made in the same year and similarly suppressed but though both these houses were of the smaller sort it is quite evident from a cursory glance at these inventories that they were pretty rich in jewels and plate by the term jewels is meant plate wherein jewels were set as to the plate it was of course the sacramental vessels and appurtenances and judging by these entries the whole mass of plate must have been considerable uh, worth a good deal eh he asked a great deal and if it's in existence now much more than a great deal i replied but I'll read you some of the items set down here. I'll read a few haphazard. They are set down, you see, with their weight in ounces specified, and you'll observe what a number of items there are in each inventory. We'll look at just a few. A chalice, twenty-eight ounces. Another chalice, thirty-six ounces. A mazer, forty-seven ounces. One pair candlesticks, fifty-two ounces. Two cruets, thirty-one ounces one censer twenty-eight ounces one cross fifty-eight ounces another cross forty-eight ounces three dozen spoons forty-eight ounces one salt with covering twenty-eight ounces a great cross seventy-two ounces a patten sixteen ounces another patten twenty ounces three tablets of proper gold work eighty-five ounces in all and so on and so on a very nice collection, Scarterfield, considering that these are only a few items at random, out of some seventy or eighty altogether. But we can easily reckon up the total weight. Indeed, it's already reckoned up at the foot of each inventory. At Forestburn, you see, there was a sum total of 2,238 ounces of plate. At Mellerton, 1,870 ounces so these two inventories represent a mass of about four thousand ounces worth having scarterfield in either the sixteenth or the twentieth century and in the main it would be what asked scarterfield gold silver some of it gold some silver a good deal of it silver gilt i replied i can tell all that by reading the inventories more attentively but i've told you what a mere cursory glance shows four thousand ounces of plate some of it jewelled he soliloquized who and what do you make of it mr middlebrook i mean of all that i've told you putting everything together that you've told me i answered with some confidence i make this of it this plate originally church property came we won't ask how into the hands of the late lord forestburn and may have been in possession of his family hidden away perhaps for four centuries but at any rate it was in his possession and he deposited it with his bankers across the way he may indeed not have known what was in it again he may have known now i take it that the dishonest temporary manager you told me of examined these chests decided to appropriate their valuable contents and enlisted the services of netherfield baxter in his nefarious labours I think that these inventories were found in the chests, one probably in each, and that Baxter kept them out of sheer curiosity. You say he was a fellow of some education. As for the plate, I think he and his associate hid it somewhere. And, if you want my honest opinion, it was for that that Salter Quick was looking. Scarterfield clapped his hand on the table. That's it, he exclaimed. Hanged if I don't think that myself. It's my opinion that this Netherfield Baxter, when he looked at it out of here, got into far regions and strange company, came into touch with those quicks, and told them the secret of this stolen plate. 
He was, I'm sure, the netherfield of that ship the Quicks were on. Yes, sir, I think we may safely bet on it that Salter Quick, as you say, was looking for this plate. And so was somebody else, said I, and it was that somebody else who murdered Salter Quick. Aye, he assented. Now, who? That's the question. And what's the next thing to do, Mr. Middlebrook? It seems to me that the next thing to do is to find out all you can about this plate, I replied. If I were you, I should take two people into your confidence, the head man, director, chairman, or whatever he is at the bank, and the present Lord Forestburn. I will, he agreed. I'll see him both first thing tomorrow morning. Do you go with me, Mr. Middlebrook? You'll explain these old papers better than I should. So Scarterfield and I spent that evening together in the little hotel, and after dinner I explained the inventories more particularly. I came to the conclusion that if the four thousand ounces of plate specified in them were in the chests which the dishonest temporary bank manager had stolen, he had got a very fine haul. The value, of course, of the plate was not so much intrinsic as extrinsic. There were collectors, English and American, who would cheerfully give vast sums for pre-Reformation sacramental vessels. Transactions of this kind, I fancied, must have been in the minds of the thieves. There were features of the whole affair which puzzled me. Not the least important was my wonder that this plate, undeniably church property, should have remained so long in the Forestburn family without being brought into the light of day. I hoped that our inquiries next morning would bring some information on that point. But we got no information, at least none of any consequence. All that was known by the authorities at the bank was that the late Lord Forestburn had deposited two chests of plate with them years before, with instructions that they were to remain in the bank's custody until his son succeeded him. Even then they were not to be opened unless the son had already come of age. The bank people had no knowledge of the precise contents of the chests. All they knew was that they contained plate. As for the present Lord Forestburn, a very young man, he knew nothing, except that his father's mysterious deposit had been burgled by a dishonest custodian. He expressed no opinion about anything, therefore. But the chief authority at the bank, a crusty and self-sufficient old gentleman, who seemed to consider Scarterfield and myself as busybodies, pooh-poohed the notion that the inventories which we showed him had anything to do with the rifled forest-burned chests, and scorned the notion that the family had ever been in possession of goods obtained by sacrilege. Preposterous, he said with a sniff of contempt. What the chests contain was, of course, superfluous family plate. As for these documents, that fellow Baxter, in spite of his loose manner of living, was, I remember, a bit inclined to scholarship, and went in for old books and things, a strange mixture altogether. He probably picked up these parchments in some bookseller's shop in Durham or Newcastle. I don't believe they've anything to do with Lord Forestburn's stolen property, and I advise you both not to waste your time in running after mare's nests. Scarterfield and I got ourselves out of this starchy person's presence, and confided to each other our private opinions of him and his intelligence. For to us the theory which we had set up was unassailable. We tried to reduce it to strict and formal precision as we ate our lunch in a quiet corner of the hotel coffee-room previous to parting. More than one of us, Scarterfield, who have taken part in this discussion, have said that if we are going to get at the truth of things, we shall have to go back, I observed. Well, what you have found out here takes us back some way. Let us suppose, we can't do anything without a certain amount of supposition. Let us, I say, for the sake of argument, suppose that the man Netherfield of Blythe, who was with Noah and Salter Quick on the ship Elizabeth Robinson, bound from Hong Kong to Chemopo, is the same person as Netherfield Baxter, who certainly lived in this town a few years ago. Very well. Now then, what do we know of Baxter? We know this, 
that a dishonest bank manager stole certain valuables from the bank, died suddenly just afterwards, and that Baxter disappeared just as suddenly. The supposition is that Baxter was concerned in that theft. We'll suppose more, that Baxter knew where the stolen goods were, had, in fact, helped to secrete them. Well, the next we hear of him is, supposing him to be Netherfield, on this ship, which, according to the reports you got at Lloyd's, was lost with all hands in the Yellow Sea. But, a big but, we know now that whatever happened to the rest of those on board, three men, at any rate, saved their lives. Noah Quick, Salter Quick, and the Chinese cook, whose exact name we've forgotten, but one of whose patronymics was Chu. Chu turns up at Lloyd's in London, and asks a question about the ship. Noah Quick materialises at Devonport, and runs a public house. Salter joins him there. And presently Salter is up on the Northumbrian coast, professing great anxiety to find a churchyard, or churchyards, wherein are graves with the name Netherfield on them. He makes the excuse that that is the family name of his mother's people. Now we know what happened to Salter Quick, and we also know what happened to Noah Quick. But now I'm wondering if something else happened before that. I, Mr. Middlebrook, said Scarterfield, and what now? I'm wondering, I answered, leaning nearer to him across the little table at which we sat, if Noah and Salter, severally or conjointly, had murdered this Netherfield Baxter before they themselves were murdered? They, or somebody who was in with them, who afterwards murdered them? Do you understand? I'm afraid I don't, he said. No, I don't quite see things. Look you here, Scarterfield, said I. Supposing a gang of men, men of no conscience, desperate, adventurous men, gets together, as men were together on that ship, the doings and fate of which seem to be pretty mysterious, they're all out for what they can get. One of them is in possession of a valuable secret, and he imparts it to the others, or to some of them, a chosen lot. There have been known such cases, where a secret is shared by, say, five or six men, in which murder after murder occurs until the secret is only held by one or two. A half share in a thing is worth more than one-sixth, Scarterfield, and a secret of one is far more valuable than a secret shared with three. Do you understand now? I see, he answered slowly. You mean that Salter and Noah may have got rid of Netherfield Baxter, and that somebody has got rid of them? Precisely, said I. You put it very clearly. Well, he said, if that's so, there are, as has been plain all along, two men concerned in putting the quicks out of the way. For Noah was finished off on the same night that saw Salter finished, and there was four hundred miles distance between the scenes of their respective murders. The man who killed Noah was not the man who killed Salter, to be sure. Of course, I agreed. We've always known there were two. There may be more, a gang of them, and remarkably clever fellows. But I'm getting sure that the desire to recover some hidden treasure, valuables, something of that sort, was at the bottom of it, and now I'm all the surer because of what we found out about this monastic spoil. But there are things that puzzle me. Such as what? he asked. Well, that eagerness of Salter Quick's to find a churchyard with the name Netherfield on the stones, I replied, and his coming to that part of the Northumbrian coast expecting to find it. Because, so far as the experts know, there is no such name on any stone, nor in any parish register in all that district. Who, then, told him of the name? You see, if my theory is correct, and Baxter told him and Noah, he'd tell them the exact locality. Ah, but would he, said Scarterfield, he mightn't. He might only give them a general notion. Still, Netherfield it was that Salter asked for. That's certain, said I, and I'm puzzled why. But I'm puzzled still more about another thing. If the men who murdered Noah and Salter Quick were in possession of the secret as well, why did they rip their clothes to pieces searching for something? Why later did somebody steal that tobacco box 
from under the very noses of the police. Scarterfield shook his head. The shake meant a great deal. That fairly settles me, he remarked. Why, the murderer must have been actually present at the inquest. But at that I shook my head. Oh, dear me, no, said I, not at all. But some agent of his was certainly there. My own impression is that Mr. Cazalet's eagerness about that box gave the whole show away. Shall I tell you how I figure things out? Well, I think there were men, we don't know who, that either knew with absolute certainty, or were pretty sure that Noah Quick and Salter Quick were in possession of a secret, and that one or the other, and perhaps both, carried it on him in the shape of papers. Each was killed for that secret. The murderers found nothing in either case. But Mr. Cazalet's remarks, made before a lot of men, drew attention to the tobacco box, and the murderer determined to get it. And what was easier than to abstract it at the inquest, where it was exhibited in company with several other things of Salter's? "'I can't say if it was easy or not, Mr. Middlebrook,' observed Scarterfield. "'Were you there, present?' "'I was there,' said I. "'So were most of the people of the neighbourhood, "'as many as could get into the room, anyway. "'A biggish room. "'There'd be a couple of hundred people in it. "'And many of them were strangers. "'When the proceedings were over, "'men were crowding about the table "'on which Quick's things had been laid out "'for exhibition to the coroner and the jury. "'What easier than for someone to pick up that box? "'The place was so crowded "'that such an action would pass unnoticed.' "'Very evident it did,' observed Scarterfield. "'But I've heard of such things being taken out of sheer curiosity, "'morbid desire to get hold of something that had to do with the murder. "'However, if this particular thing was abstracted by the murderer, "'or by somebody acting on his behalf, "'it looks as if he or they were on the spot. "'And then, that affair of Mr. Cazalet's pocket-book.' "'Well, Scarterfield,' said I, there's another way of regarding both these thefts. Supposing tobacco-box and pocket-book were stolen, not as a means of revealing a secret, but so that no one else, Cazalet or anybody, should get at it, eh? There's something in that, he admitted thoughtfully. You mean that the murderers had already got rid of the quicks, so that there should be two less in the secret, and these things stolen lest outsiders should get any inkling of it? Precisely, I answered. Closeness and secrecy. That's been at the back of everything so far. I tell you, you're dealing with unusually crafty brains. I wish I could get the faintest idea of whose brains they were, he sighed. A direct clue now? Before he could say any more, one of the hotel servants came into the coffee room and made for our table. "'There's a man in the hall asking for Mr. Scarterfield,' he announced. "'Looks like a seafaring man, sir. "'He says Mrs. Ormthwaite told him he'd find you here.' "'Woman with whom Baxter used to lodge,' muttered Scarterfield, in an aside to me. "'Come along, Mr. Middlebrook. "'You never know what you mayn't hear.' "'We went out into the hall. "'There, twisting his cap in his hands, stood a big, brown-bearded man.' End of chapter 13。chapter 14 of Ravensdean Court by J. S. Fletcher。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Solomon Fish。it needed but one glance at Scarterfield's visitor to assure me that he was a person who would use the sea. there was the suggestion of salt water and strong winds all over him from his grizzled hair and beard to his big brawny hands and square-set build he looked the sort of man who all his life had been looking out across wide stretches of ocean and battling with the forces of nature in her roughest moods just then there was questioning in his keen blue eyes he was obviously wondering with all the native suspicion of a simple soul what scarterfield might be after "'You're asking for me?' said the detective. The man glanced from one to the other of us, then jerked a big thumb in the direction of some region beyond the open door behind his burly figure. 
Mrs. Ormthwaite, he said, bending a little towards Scarterfield. She said as how there was a gentleman stopping in this here house, as was making inquiries, d'ye see, about Netherfield Baxter, as used to live hereabouts, so I come along. Scarterfield contrived to jog my elbow. Without a word he turned towards the door of the smoking-room, motioning his visitor to follow. We all went into the corner wherein, on the previous afternoon, Scarterfield had told me of his investigations and discoveries at Blythe. Evidently I was now to hear more. But Scarterfield asked for no further information until he had provided our companion with refreshment in the shape of a glass of rum and a cigar, and his first question was of a personal sort. "'What's your name, then?' he inquired. "'Fish,' replied the visitor promptly. "'Solomon, as everybody is aware.' Blythe man, no doubt, suggested Scarterfield. Born and bred, master, said Fish, and lived here always, excepting when I've been away, which to be sure has been considerable. But whether north or south, east or west, always make for the old spot when on dry land. That is to say, when in this here country. Then you know Netherfield Baxter? asked Scarterfield. Fish waved his cigar. As a baby, as a boy, as a young man, he declared, cut many a toy boat for him at one stage, taught him to fish at another, went sailing with him in a bit of a yawl that he had when he was growed up. Know him? Do I know my own mother? Just so, said Scarterfield, understandingly. To be sure, you know Baxter quite well, of course. He paused a moment, and then leaned across the table round which the three of us were sitting. "'And when did you see him last?' he asked. Fish, to my surprise, laughed. It was a queer laugh. There was incredulity, uncertainty, a sense of vagueness in it. It suggested that he was puzzled. "'I once,' said he, "'that's just it, master. And I ask you, and this other gent, which I take him to be a friend of yours and confidential, I ask you, can a man trust his own eyes and his own ears, can he now, solemn? I've always trusted mine, Fish, answered Scarterfield. Same here, master, till a while ago, replied Fish, but now I ain't so mortal sure of that matter as I was, cause according to my eyes, and according to my ears, I see Netherfield Baxter, and I hear Netherfield Baxter inside of three weeks ago. He brought down his big hand on the table with a hearty smack as he spoke the last word or two. The sound of it was followed by a dead silence in which Scarterfield and I exchanged quick glances. Fish picked up his tumbler, took a gulp at its contents, and set it down with emphasis. "'Gospel truth!' he exclaimed. "'That you did see him?' asked Scarterfield. "'Gospel truth, master, that if my eyes and ears is to be trusted, I see him and I hear him,' declared Fish. "'Only,' he continued after a pause, during which he stared fixedly, first at me, then at Scarterfield, "'only he said as how he wasn't he. Do you understand? Denied hisself?' "'What you mean is that the man you took for Baxter said you were mistaken, and that he wasn't Baxter,' suggested Scarterfield." that it you puts it very plain master assented fish that is what did happen but if the man i refers to wasn't netherfield baxter then i've no more eyes than this here cigar and no more ears than that glass fact but you've never had reason to doubt either before i suppose said scarterfield and you're not inclined to doubt them now now then let's get to business you really believe, Fish, that you met Netherfield Baxter about three weeks ago? That's about it, isn't it? Never mind what the man said. You took him to be Baxter. Now, where was this? Hull, replied Fish. Three weeks ago come Friday. Under what circumstances? asked Scarterfield. Tell us about it. Ain't such a long story neither, remarked Fish and seeing as how, according to Widow Ormthwaite, you're making some inquiries about Baxter, I don't mind telling, cause I've been mighty puzzled ever since I see this chap. Well, you see, I landed at Hull for my last voyage. 
been out eastward and back with a trading vessel what belongs to hull owners and before coming home here to blyth knocked about a day or two in that port with an old messmate of mine that i chanced to meet there now then one morning as i say three weeks ago it is come this friday me and my mate which his name is jim shanks of hartlepool and can corroborate as they call it what i says we turns into a certain old-fashioned place there is there in hull in a bit of an alley off high street you'll know hull no doubt you gentlemen never been there replied scarterfield i have said i i know it well especially the high street then you'll know governor that all around about that high street there's still a lot of queer old places as ancient as what is continued fish me and my mate shanks knew one what we'd oft use in times past the goose and crane as snug a spot as you'll find in any shipping town in this here country maybe you'll know it i've seen it from the outside fish i answered a fine old front half timber that's it governor and as pleasant inside as its remarkable outside he said well my mate and me we goes in there for a morning glass and into a room where you'll find some interesting folk about that time of day there's a sign on the door of that room gentlemen what reads for master mariners only but it's an old piece of work and you don't want to take no heed of it me and shanks we ain't master mariners though we may look it in our shore rig out and we've used that room whenever we've been in hull well now we gets our glasses and our cigars and we sits down in a quiet corner to enjoy ourselves and observe what company drops in some queer old birds there is comes into that place i do assure you gentlemen and some strange tales of seafaring life you can hear howsomever there wasn't nothing particular struck me that morning until it was getting on to dinner-time and me and shanks was thinking of laying a course for our lodgings where we'd ordered a special bit of dinner to celebrate our happy meeting like when in comes the man i'm talking about and if he wasn't netherfield baxter what i'd known ever since he was the height of a six pennyworth of copper then says i a man's eyes and a man's ears isn't to be trusted fish said scarterfield who is listening intently it'll be best if you give us a description of this man tell us as near as you can what he's like i mean of course the man you saw at the goose and crane our visitor seemed to pull his mental faculties together he took another pull at his glass and several at his cigar well he said taint much in my line that me not being a scholar but i can give a general idea d'ye see master a tallish good-looking chap as the women would call handsome sort of rakish fellow you understand dressed very smart blue serge suit good stuff new straw hat black band brown boots polished and shining quite the swell as netherfield always was even when he'd got through his money the gentleman lord bless your souls i knew him for all that i hadn't seen him for several years and that he'd grown a beard a beard eh interrupted scarterfield beard and moustache assented fish what colour asked scarterfield what you might call a golden brown replied fish cut the beard was to a point suited him scarterfield drew out his pocket-book and produced a slightly faded photograph that of a certain good-looking rather nattish young man taken in company with a fox terrier he handed it to fish is that baxter he asked ay as he was years ago said fish i know that well enough used to be one of them in the photographer's window down the street outside here but now do you see he's grown a beard otherwise the same well said scarterfield what happened this man came in was he alone no replied fish he'd two other men with him one was a chap about his own age just as smart as what he was and dressed similar t'other was an older man in his shirt sleeves and without a hat seemed to me he'd brought baxter and his friend across from some shop or other to stand him a drink 
Anyways, he did call for drinks, whiskey and soda, and the three on em stood together talking. And as soon as I heard Baxter's voice, I was dead sure about him. He'd always had a highish voice, talked as a gentleman talks, you see, for of course he was brought up that way, highly educated, you understand? "'What were these three talking about?' asked Scarterfield. "'Far as I could make out about ship's fittings,' answered Fish. "'Something of that sort, anyway, but I didn't take much notice of their talk. I was too much taken up watching Baxter, and growing more certain every minute, you see, that it was him. Excepting that a few years does make a bit of difference, and that he's grown a beard, I didn't see no great alteration in him. Yet I see one thing.' I asked Scarterfield, what now? A scar on his left cheek, replied Fish. What begun underneath his beard has covered most of it, and went up to his cheekbone, just an inch or so showing, do you understand? That's been knife's work, thinks I to myself. You've had your cheek laid open with a knife, my lad, somewhere and somehow. Struck me, then, he'd grown a beard to hide it. Very likely, assented Scarterfield. Well, and what happened? You spoke to this man? I waited and watched, continued Fish. I'm one as has been trained to use his eyes. Now I see two or three little things about this man as I remembered about Baxter. There was a way he had of chucking up his chin. There it was. Another of playing with his watch chain when he talked. It was there. And of slapping his leg with his walking stick. That was there, too. Jim, I says to my mate, if that ain't a man I used to know, I'm a Dutchman. Which, of course, I ain't. And so, when the three of them sets down their glasses and turns to the door, I jumps up and makes for my man, holding out a hand to him, friendly. And then, of course, come all the surprise. Didn't know you, I suppose, suggested Scarterfield. I tell you what happened, answered Fish. Morning, Mr. Baxter, says I. It's a long time since I've had the pleasure of seeing you, sir. And, as I say, shoves my hand out hearty. He turns and gives me a hard, keen look. Not taken aback, mind you, but searching-like. You're mistaken, my friend, he says, quiet, but pleasant. You're taking me for somebody else. What, says I, all of a heap, ain't you, Mr. Netherfield Baxter, what I used to know at Blythe up way north? "'That I'm certainly not,' says he, as cool as the North Pole. "'Then I ax your pardon, sir,' says I, "'and all I can say is that I never see two gentlemen "'so much alike in all my born days, and hoping no offence. "'Not at all,' says he, as pleasant as might be. "'They say everybody has a double.' "'And at that he gives me a polite nod, "'and out he goes with his pals, "'and I turns back to Shanks,' Jim, says I, don't let me ever trust my eyes and ears no more, Jim, I says. I'm a breaking up, Jim, that's what it is, thinking I sees things when I don't. Stow all that, says Jim, what's a practical sort of man. You was only mistook, says he. I've been in that case more than once, he says. Wherever there's a man, there's another somewheres that is like him as two peas is like each other. Let's go home to dinner, he says. So we went off to the lodgings, and at first I was sure I'd been mistaken. But later, and now, well, I ain't. That there man was Netherfield Baxter. You feel sure of it, suggested Scarterfield. I certain, Master, declared Fish. I've had time to think it over and to reckon it all up, and now I'm sure it was him, only he wasn't going to let out that it was. Now, if I'd only chanced on him when he was by himself, what? You'd have got just the same answer, said the detective laconically. He didn't want to be known. You saw no more of him in Hull, of course. Yes, I did, answered Fish. I saw him again that night. And, as regards one of them at any rate, in queerish company. What was that? asked Scarterfield. Well, replied Fish, me and Jim Shanks, we went home to dinner, couple of roast chickens and a nice bit of sirloin to follow, and after that we'd had a nice comfortable sleep for the rest of the afternoon, 
and then, after a wash-up and a drop of tea, we went out to look round the town a bit for an evening's diversion, d'ye see? Not to any particular place, but just strolling around, like, as sailor men will, being ashore and stretching their legs. And it so came about that latish in the evening we turned into the smoking room of the cross keys in the market place. Maybe this here friend of yours, seeing as he's been in Hull, knows that. I know it, Fish, said I. Then you'll know that you goes in at an archway, turns in at your right, and there you are, he said. Well, Shanks and me, we goes in casual-like, not expecting anything that you wouldn't expect but we'd no sooner sat us down in that smoking-room and taken an observation than I sees the very same man that I'd seen at the Goose and Crane, him that I'd taken for Baxter. There he was in a corner of the room, and the other smart-dressed man with him, their glasses in front of them, and their cigars in their mouths. And with them there was something else that I certainly didn't go for to expect to see in that place." what asked scarterfield what i seen plenty of time and again in various parts of this ere world and ain't so mighty fond of seeing answered fish with a scowl a chink a what demanded the detective a chink he means a chinaman said i that's it isn't it fish that's it governor assented fish a yellow-skinned slit-eyed thin-fingered chinee with a face like an image and a voice like silk, which, he added, scowling more than ever, is pison that I can't abide know-how, having seen more than enough of. I looked at Scarterfield. He had been attentive enough all through the course of our visitor's story, but I saw that his attention had redoubled since the last words. A Chinaman, he said in a low voice, with him as i say master a chinee and with that there man what when all said and done i'm certain was and is netherfield baxter reiterated fish but mind you and here's the queer part of it he wasn't no common chinaman not the sort you'll see by the score down in limehouse way or in liverpool or in cardiff not at all lord bless you this here chap was smarter dressed than t'other two swell made dark clothes gold-handled umbrella kid gloves on his blooming hands and a silk top hat a regular dude but a chink well said scarterfield after a pause during which he seemed to be thinking a good deal anything happen nothing happened master what should happen replied fish them here were in their corner and jim shanks and me we was in ours they were busy talking amongst themselves, of course, we heard nothing. And at last all three went out. "'Did the man you take to be Baxter look at you?' asked Scarterfield. "'Never showed a sign of it,' declared Fish. Him and T'other passed us on their way to the door, but he took no notice. "'See him again anywhere?' inquired Scarterfield. "'No, I didn't,' replied Fish. I left Hull early next morning and went to see relatives of mine at South Shields. Only came home a day or two since, and happening to pass the time of day with the widow Ormthwaite this morning, I told her what I've told you. Then she told me that you was inquiring about Baxter, Governor, so I comes along here to see you. What might you be wanting with my gentleman now? Scarterfield told Fish enough to satisfy and quiet him and presently the man went away, having first told us that he would be at home for another month. When he had gone, Scarterfield turned to me. There, he said, what do you think of that, Mr. Middlebrook? What do you think of it, I suggested. I think that Netherfield Baxter is alive and active and up to something, he answered, and I'd give a good deal to know who that Chinaman is who is with him. But there's other ways of finding out a lot now that I've heard all this, Mr. Middlebrook. I'm off to Hull. Come with me. Until that instant such an idea had never entered my mind. But I made up my mind there and then. I will, said I. We'll see this through, Scarterfield. Get a timetable. 
End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of Ravenstein Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Jallanby, Shipbroker. There were reasons, other than the suddenly excited desire to follow this business out to whatever end it might come at, which induced me to consent to the detective's suggestion that I should go to Hull with him. As I had said to Solomon Fish, I knew Hull well enough. In my very youthful days I had spent an annual holiday there with relatives, and I had vivid recollections of the place. Already in those days they had begun to pull Hull to pieces, laying out fine new streets and open spaces where there had been old-fashioned narrow alleys and not a little in the slum way. But then, as happily now, there was still the old hull of the ancient high street and the market-place and the land of green ginger and the older docks wharves and quays it had been amongst these survivals of antiquity and in the great church of holy trinity with its scarcely less notable sister of st mary in logat that i had loved to wander as a boy there was a peculiar smell of the sea in hull and an atmosphere of seafaring life that I have never met with elsewhere, neither in Wapping nor in Bristol, in Southampton nor in Liverpool. One felt in Hull that one was already halfway to Bergen, or Stockholm, or Riga. There was something of North Europe about you, as soon as you crossed the bridge at the top of Whitefriar Gate, and plunged into masts and funnels, stacks of fragrant pine, and sheds bursting with foreign merchandise and I had a sudden itching and half-sentimental desire to see the old seaport again, and once more catch up its appeal and its charm. "'Yes, I'll certainly go with you, Scarterfield,' I repeated. "'In for a penny, in for a pound,' they say. "'I wonder, though, what we are in for. You think, really, we're on the track of Netherfield Baxter?' "'Haven't a doubt of it,' asserted Scarterfield, as he turned over the pages of the railway guide. That man who's just gone was right, that was Baxter he saw, with who knows what of mystery and crime and all sorts of things behind him. Including the murder of one of the quicks, I suggested. Including some knowledge of it, anyway, he said. It's a clue, Mr. Middlebrook, and I'm on it. As this man was in Hull, there'll be news of him to be picked up there, very likely in plenty. Very well, said I, I'm with you. Now? let's be off going southward by way of newcastle and york we got to hull that night late too late to do more than eat our suppers and go to bed at the station hotel and we took things leisurely next morning breakfasting late and strolling through the older part of the town before as noon drew near we approached the goose and crane we had an object in selecting time and place Fish had told us that the man whom he had seen in company with our particular quarry, the supposed Baxter, had come into the queer old inn in his shirt-sleeves and without his hat. He was therefore probably some neighbouring shop or storekeeper, and in the habit of turning into the ancient hostelry for a drink about noon. Such a man, that man, Scarterfield hoped to encounter. Out of him, if he met him, he could hope to get some news. Although, as a boy, I had often seen the street front of the Goose and Crane, I had never passed its portals. Now, entering it, we found it to be even more curious inside than it was out. It was a fine relic of Tudor days, a rabbit warren of snug rooms, old furniture, wide chimney-places, tiled floors. If the folk who lived in it and the men who frequented it had only worn the right sorts of costume, we might easily have thought ourselves to be back in Elizabethan times. We easily found the particular room of which Solomon Fish had spoken. There was the door, half open, with its legend on an upper panel in faded gilt letters, For Master Mariners Only. But as we had inferred, that warning had been set up in the old days, and was no longer a strict observance. We went into the room unquestioned by guardians or occupants, 
and calling for refreshments, sat ourselves down to watch and wait. There were several men in this quaint old parlour. All seemed, in one degree or another, to be connected with the sea. Men, thick-set, sturdy, bronzed, branded in solid suits of good blue cloth, all with that look in the eye which stamps the seafarer. Other men whom one supposed to have something to do with the sea trade, ship's chandlers, perhaps, or shipping agents. We caught stray whiffs of talk. It was all about the life of the port, and of the wide North Sea that stretches away from the Humber. And in the middle of this desultory and apparently aimless business, in came a man who, I am sure from my first glimpse of him, was the very man we wanted. A shortish, stiffly built, paunchy man, with a beefy face, shrewd eyes, and a bristling iron-grey moustache. A well-dressed man, and sporting a fine gold chain and a diamond pin in his cravat but in his shirt-sleeves and without a hat. Scarterfield leaned nearer to me. "'Our man for a million,' he muttered. "'I think so,' said I. The newcomer, evidently well known from the familiar way in which nods and brief salutations were exchanged for him, bustled up to the bar, called for a glass of bitter beer, and helped himself to a crust of bread and a bit of cheese from the provender at his elbow. Leaning one elbow on the counter, and munching his snack, he entered into conversation with one or two men near him. Here again, the talk, as far as we could catch it, was of its seafaring matters. But we did not catch the name of the man in the shirt-sleeves, and when, after he had finished his refreshment, he nodded to the company and bustled out as quickly as he had entered, Scarterfield gave me a look, and we left the room in his wake, following him. Our quarry bustled down the alley, and turned the corner into the old high street. He was evidently well known there. We saw several passers-by exchange greetings with him. Always bustling along, as if he were a man whose time was precious, he presently crossed the narrow roadway, and turned into an office, over the window of which was a sign, Jallanby Shipbroker. He had only got a foot across his threshold, however, when Scarterfield was at his elbow. "'Excuse me, sir,' he said politely. "'May I have a word with you?' The man turned, stared, evidently recognised Scarterfield as the stranger he had just seen in the Goose and Crane, and turned from him to me. "'Yes,' he answered questionably. "'What is it?' Scarterfield pulled out his pocket-book and produced his official card. "'You'll see who I am from that,' he remarked. "'This gentleman's a friend of mine, just now giving me some professional help. I take it you're Mr. Jallanby?' The shipbroker started a little as he glanced at the card and realised Scarterfield's calling. "'Yes, I'm Mr. Jallanby,' he answered. "'Come inside, gentlemen.' He led the way into a dark, rather dismal, and dusty little office, and signed to a clerk who was writing there to go out. "'What is it, Mr. Scarterfield?' he asked. "'Some information?' "'You've hit it, sir,' replied Scarterfield. "'That's just what we do want. We came here to Hull on purpose to find you, believing you can give it. From something we heard only yesterday afternoon, Mr. Jallanby, a long way from here, we believe that one morning, about three weeks ago, you were in the Goose and Crane, in that very room where we saw you just now, in company with two men, smartly dressed men, in blue serge suits and straw hats, one of them with a pointed golden-brown beard. Do you remember? I was watching the shipbroker's face while Scarterfield spoke, and I saw that deep interest, wonder, perhaps suspicion, was being aroused in him. Bless me, he exclaimed, you don't mean to say they're wanted? I mean to say that I want to get some information about them, and very particularly, answered Scarterfield. You do remember that morning, then? I remember a good many mornings, said Jallanby, readily enough. I went across there with those two several times while they were in the town. They were doing a bit of business with me. We often dropped in over yonder for a glass before dinner. But I'm surprised that, well, to put it plainly, 
that detectives should be inquiring after him i am indeed mr jallanby said scarterfield i'll be plain with you this is so far merely a matter of suspicion i'm not sure of the identity of one of these men but it's one that i want to trace at present though i should like to know who the other is but if my man is the man i believe him to be there's a matter of robbery and possibly of murder so you see how serious it is now i'll jog your memory a bit do you remember that one morning as you and these two men were leaving the goose and crane a big seafaring looking man stepped up to the bearded man you were with and claimed acquaintance with him as being one netherfield baxter jallanby started it was plain that he remembered i do he exclaimed well enough i stood by but he said he wasn't there was a mistake i believe there was no mistake said scarterfield i believe that man is netherfield baxter and it's netherfield baxter i want now mr jallanby what do you know of those two in confidence we had all been standing until then but at this invitation to disclosure the shipbroker motioned us to sit down he himself turning the stool which the clerk had just vacated this is a queer business mr scarterfield he said robbery murder nasty things nasty terms to apply to folk that one's done business with and that of course was all i did with those two men and all i know about them pleasant good-mannered gentlemanly chaps i found them why lord bless me i dined with them one night at their hotel which hotel asked scarterfield station hotel replied jallanby they were there for ten days or so while they did their business with me i never saw aught wrong about em either seemed to be what they represented themselves to be certainly they'd plenty of money for what they wanted here in hull anyway but of course that's neither here nor there what names did you know them under inquired scarterfield and where did they profess to come from well the man with the brownish beard called himself mr norman belford answered jallanby i gathered he was from london the other man was a frenchman some french lord or other from his name but i forget it mr belford always called him vicomte which i took to be french for our viscount scarterfield turned and looked at me and i too looked at him we were thinking of the same thing old cassalet's find on the bush in the scrub near the beach at Ravensdean Court, and I could not repress an exclamation. The handkerchief! Scarterfield coughed. A dry, significant cough. It meant a great deal. Aye, he said, just so, the handkerchief. Hmm. He turned to the shipbroker. Mr. Jallanby, he continued, what did these two want of you? What was their business here in Hull? I can tell you that in a very few words, answered Jallanby simple enough and straight enough on the surface so far as i was concerned anyhow they came in here one morning told me they were staying at the station hotel and said they wanted to buy a small craft of some sort that a small crew could run across the north sea to the norwegian fjords the sort of thing you can manage with three or four you know they said they were both amateur yachtsmen and of course i very soon found out that they knew what they were talking about in fact between you and me i should have said that they were as experienced in sea craft as any man could be i soon detected that i said scarterfield with a nod at me i dare say you would well it so happened that i just the very thing they seemed to want continued the shipbroker a vessel that had recently been handed over to me for disposal and then lying in the victoria dock just at the back here beyond the old harbour just the sort of craft they could sail themselves with say a man or a boy or two i can tell you exactly what she was if you like it might be very useful to know that remarked scarterfield with emphasis on the last word we may want to identify her well said jallanby she was a yawl about eighteen tons register thirty tons yacht measurement length forty-two feet beam thirteen draught seven and a half feet square stern coppered above the water line 
carried main, jib-headed mizzen, fore-staysail and jib, and in addition had a sliding gunter gaff topsail and— Here, interrupted Scarterfield with a smile, that's all too technical for me to carry in my head. If we want details, I'll trouble you to write them down later. But I take it this vessel was all ready for going to sea? Ready any day, asserted Jallanby. Only just wanted tidying up and storing. As a matter of fact, she'd been in use quite recently, but she was a bit too solid for her late owner's tastes. The truth was, she'd been originally built for a Penzance fishing lugger. Splendid sea-going boats, those. "'Do I understand that this vessel could undertake a longish voyage?' asked Scarterfield. "'For instance, could they have crossed, say, the Atlantic in her?' "'Atlantic! Lord bless you, yes,' replied the shipbroker. "'Or Pacific, either. Go tens of thousands of miles in a craft of that soundness, as long as you've got provisions on board.' "'Did they buy her?' asked Scarterfield. "'They did, at once,' replied Jallanby and paid the money for her, in cash, there and then. Check, inquired Scarterfield, laconically. No, sir, good Bank of England notes, answered Jallanby. Oh, they were all right as regards money, in my case, anyway. And you'll find the same as regards the tradesmen they dealt with here, cash on the spot. They fitted her out with provisions as soon as they got her. That, of course, took a few days. And then went off to Norway? asked Scarterfield. So I understand, assented Jallanby. That's what they said. They were going first of all to Stavanger, then to Bergen, then further north. Just the two of them, asked Scarterfield. Why, no, replied Jallanby. They were joined a day or two before they sailed by a friend of theirs, a Chinaman. Queer combination, Englishman, Frenchman, Chinaman. But this Chinaman, he was a swell, or what we should call a gentleman, you know. Mr. Belford told me, in private, that he belonged to the Chinese ambassador's suite in London. Oh, said Scarterfield, just so, a diplomat. And where did he stop, here? Oh, he joined them at the hotel, answered Jallanby. He'd come there that night I dined with him. Quiet, very gentlemanly little chap, quite the gentleman, you know. And his name? asked Scarterfield but the shipbroker held up a deprecating hand. "'Don't ask me,' he said. "'I heard it, but I'm not up to those Chinese names. Still, you'd find it in the hotel register, no doubt. But really, gentlemen, you surprise me. I should never have thought. Yet you never know who people are, do you? Nice, pleasant, well-behaved fellows these were, and—' "'Ah,' said Scarterfield, with deep significance, "'it's a queer world, Mr. Jallanby. Now then, for the moment, oblige me by keeping all this to yourself. But two questions. First, how long since is it that these chaps sailed for Bergen? Second, what is the name of this smart little vessel? They sailed precisely three weeks ago next Monday, answered the shipbroker, and the name of the vessel is the Blanche Flower. We left Mr. Jallanby then, promising to see him again, and went away. I was wondering what the detective made out of all this, and I waited with some curiosity for him to speak. But we had got halfway up the old high street before Scarterfield opened his lips, and then his tone was a blend of speculation and distrust. Now, I wonder where those chaps have gone, he muttered. Of course they haven't gone to Norway. Of course that Chinese chap wasn't from the Chinese legation in London. The whole thing's a bluff. By this time they'll have altered the name of that yawl, and gone where? In search of that buried stuff, to be sure. If the man who called himself Belford is really Baxter, he'll know precisely where it is, I said. Ay, just so, Mr. Middlebrook, assented Scarterfield. But there's been time in all these years to shift that stuff from one place to another. I haven't the slightest doubt that Belford is Baxter, and that he and his associates bought that vessel as the easiest way of getting the stuff from wherever it's hid. But where are we to look for them and their craft? Have they gone north or south? It would be a waste of time and money to cable to the Norwegian ports for news of them. They're not gone there, that I'll swear. 
Scarterfield, said I, feeling convinced on the matter, if the man's Baxter, and he's after that stuff, he's gone north. The stuff is near Blythe, dead certain. I dare say you're right, he said slowly, and, as I've found out all there is to find out here in Hull, I suppose a return to Blythe is the most advisable thing. After all, we know what to look out for on that coast. A twenty-ton yawl with an Englishman, a Frenchman, and a Chinaman aboard her? Very well. So that afternoon, after seeing the shipbroker again, and making certain arrangements with him in case he heard anything of the Blanche Flower and her crew of three queerly assorted individuals, we retraced our steps northward. But while Scarterfield turned off at Newcastle for Tynemouth and Blythe, I went alone for Alnwick and Ravensdean Court. End of chapter 15